Well, good morning, guys. Again, I know I love to come up here, and I, you know you don't know what else to really say when you start. So, uh, uh, but uh, today we're finishing up this series called Under God, and um, you know you can kind of while the, it's starting to get a little calmer, you can kind of see that it, the country is still divided and everything that's kind of happening. But uh, I, I think this is a good point for us to, I think every week as we go a little further, it'll calm down and calm down and, and, and we'll start finding some unity. But what I really wanted to talk about the last week of this is just kind of the grace and truth. Um, if you open up your Bibles to John 1, or if you're following along the app, we're going to start there. And it's just really John 1, 1. And it says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. That light shines in the darkness, and in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who have come from the Father, and full of grace and truth. And so this is where it gets kind of important, and this, this grace and truth, uh, and, and really when you start looking at it, and you start listening to the, what, what is, what's kind of being shared here is, you know, for most, to the, for most of our, you know, our existence, and really since Jesus was here, you know, actually let me kind of rephrase that, since about 300 A.D., people embraced Jesus. From about 300 AD, they embraced him. You know, it, they were, people were terrified beginning. You know, where us, we walk around and you see people all the time with a cross around their neck. You know, you see that happen a lot. Prior to uh, about 1100, you would never do that because the crucifixion was still happening at that point. You know, people, they were still being crucified. People were being, you know, there's, there's, if you, if you look at the whole coast of Italy at about 340 AD, the entire thing was lined with Christians being crucified. It wasn't a representation that you would want to wear around your neck. We wear it now as a semblance of what happened and the sacrifice that has been made. But back then, it wasn't one of those things that you wanted to have, that you hung on, you know, it, it, it just wasn't there. And, and really, we've embraced Jesus prior to about 1970 in this country. So in this country and in Western Europe and, and, and such, it's really... We embraced. We, Jesus was, amari- it was amazing and is amazing, but the country embraced it. And, and really in about 1970, in the early 1960s, it started making this shift. And it became less and less relevant. And if you look at what Bar- Barna research, Barna does church research all the time, and it, it, it says 48% of Americans identify themselves as post-Christian. That means that they went to church, they walked in the door, they've been here as kids, whatever it was. And, and, and the reality was something didn't click or we, we got them mad or we offended them or something along those lines and they left. They had some connection with Christianity and now they've rejected it. It's 48% of Americans. Now, it's not that they don't know. See, that's the thing is it's not that they don't know Christ. They don't care. That's the problem is they just don't care anymore. We've taken the message and we turn it in, and instead of having grace and truth, what the Bible opens up with, instead of having grace and truth, we've either done too much truth or too much grace. We've had one or the other instead of a balance between them. It's just been, it's one or the other. Instead of actually helping one another grow or instead of holding one another accountable, we're like, oh, it's okay. God has grace and everything's going to be part. And there's a balance. It says full of grace and truth. See, the thing is, is faith has moved from being in the center to now it's on the fringe. You know, and it's moved from being something that's been positive to now it's actually taken as a threat sometimes. You know, it's been, you know, faith in Jesus was a huge positive and all of a sudden now people feel threatened by Christians and by, by people that are followers of Christ. And see, the thing is, is that you start seeing some of these things, you know, you look out there and you watch online and, and you see people on Facebook and I see the post that happens all the time. Uh, what is it? It says that Jesus says, if you deny me in front of men, then, you know, and, and then I will deny you in front of my father. And so people post, I am a Christian. And, and, and see, the thing is, is that people feel threatened by that sometimes. Are we scaring them into Christianity? 
you know, and, and see, the thing is, is that we're not ashamed, right? We say, I'm not ashamed. And, you know, with that word Christian, is kind of loaded. You know, what type of Christian are you? Are you the, are you the, the gun-packing Christian, or are you the, I love you Christian? Which one are you? You know, and it's kind of one of those questions. And, and if you get to, you start looking at that, you get that, 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 that evangelical Christian. You hear that word, and all of a sudden, that one's loaded even more. People are like, I'm an evangelical Christian. They're like, oh, you think I'm a bigot? You hate me. It is what happens sometimes. See, here's the thing, is that we have to get to this point, and we have to realize, you know, guys, as, if, you look at, if you look at as the world gets darker, the light tends to shine brighter. As, we, as, as the world is getting dark, you know, I want to give you this, this, this just simple, simple exercise that you can try at home tonight. You know, go into the darkest room of your house, turn off all the lights, and light a single candle. See how brightly that shines in there. That one candle. The darkest room of your house. And you can take it, and, you can, and all of a sudden, you'll see it. You get this different impression, and you, and you can see that that one... That one light will shine bright. Lights up the entire room a lot of times. Now, does it get in all the dark places and all the, you know, and all the shadows? No. But it's a beacon. And people see it. And they're drawn towards that. You know, you ever walk into a dark room and, and, and you see the one light? You, you kind of navigate towards that. And you try and avoid all the obstacles. I do that every night as I walk into the room sometimes. Because on the nightstand, my watch will be sitting there and it lights up. And, and so I try and navigate to get to that. You know, it's the one light that I can navigate towards. But, and we do that, and it's, it's, it draws us in. See, it draws me to my pillow, but it draws us in. <laughs> See, the thing is, Jesus didn't tell us to hide from the world. He didn't tell us to do that. He says, go into it and make disciples. He didn't say, go hide and go, go you know, go, go be in the tunnels and go be in the caves and go thrash wheat with a wine press. He didn't tell us to go do those things. He said, go out. He didn't say, go run from culture. He said, go be part of it. Go influence culture. It's what we're told to do. We're called to be an influence. We're called to be, hey, one of these, we're called to be the beacon, that light that people are drawn to, the city on the hill. And the thing is, is that so often we're not doing that. So often we're hiding and we, and we, try, and, we try and put a cover on it. We're like, oh, that's too bright. How do I, what do I got to cover this thing up? And it makes it to where we're not really actually living the life that Jesus asked us to live. Yesterday during men's group, I asked this question, and it's not going to pop up, but I asked this question. I said, Ephesians 4, 8 gives us this line that you see people use all the time. It says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And, and people utilize this line often. They use it to go, oh, I'm going to go out. I'm going to go work out in the gym. You know, Ephesians 4, 8 gives me strength to go do that. <laughs> really? It gave you strength to go work out in the gym? Uh, maybe. Maybe. I think the reality is he gives you all he gives you strength to be able to pursue and be able to to, to go out into this and live that 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 life that has this light that people are drawn to. While people are tearing you down and people are trying to drag you down and people are trying to go why are you doing that and they're trying to deter you from the road that he's put you on and he's leading you down. That's the strength that he gives you. He gives you the strength to have confidence, the strength to go, I can walk this road. I can I know he's with me. It's not because he wants you to go work out or he wants you to maintain your diet. Those are all things that you can do. But, it's, but that's, he gives you the strength so that you can do what he's asked you to do. To be confident, to be the light, to be the city on the hill. And we look at it and go, oh no, I, he gives me strength to get up this morning. He did that. But he did it for you to go pursue and go make disciples. That's why he gives you strength. I can do all of this. I can live this life. I can live a life of integrity. I can live a life that people look to and they go, there's something different about him, how he loves, or about her, how she, how she always helps one another. That's the strength that's given to us. To, and when so often we, we run from it. How do we live a faith-filled life for Jesus in a post-Christian culture? And number one, we should live with with grace and truth. And I'll go back to this, John 1, 14. It says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. One of the biggest challenges is we're, one far, we're, 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 two, we're going one way or the other. The truth, what happens is you get those out there, they go, the Bible says, right? You hear this line? The Bible says this. 
you're a sinner, you're going to go to hell. That's what the Bible says. And there is truth to that. See, that's the, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and we get to this point and there's no morals. That's what it is. Here's the point. This is what it says. And grace, kind of a little different, it goes, I'm okay. You're okay. We're all okay. God understands. He loves you. Just be happy. Woohoo! There was a whole song that was written about it, right? Don't worry. I'm not going to sing it because you'll all just be like, you really can't sing. I'm out of here. You know, but the reality is, is that, uh, and everybody, and everybody sung along with it for the first, you know, for 10 years in the eighties, everybody heard that song in the eighties and was like, that's a pretty good little mantra to live by. I'll, you know, I'll, that'll be my little, uh, Timon and Pumbaa thing. You know, that's going to be, a, that's going to be what I'm going to live by. And that's what they've done. They've lived by this whole mantra of, I just got to be happy. You know, and that's what it is, is that this, this, we've gotten too much grace. Here's the thing, is that truth without grace <clears throat> leads to rules and rebellion. Truth without grace leads to rules and rebellion. Rules. Legalism. Now, I want you to think about this, this, this line, legalism. So we're asked to get up in the morning and spend time with God. Here's the legalism thing. When I get up in the morning... The first thing on my mind is a beeline to the bathroom. <laughs> Anybody have that as well? Anybody get up in the morning and go, I got to go use the restroom. I, I really, really do not want to change the sheets. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, so here's the thing is that if I was to be legalistic and go, I have to spend time with God before anything else, that means that I'm going to be changing the sheets every night or every morning. And I should put my mattress in plastic. But, you know, see, that's legalistic, right? That's, and that's not what we're called to do. We're not called, it says, you know, get up and, 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 and do what you got to do. Go get that cup of coffee. You know, I, I had to use a couple days ago. I was looking at this and this cup says church fuel on the side of it. And I go, that's exactly what this is. This is church fuel, baby. But, but get that cup of, you know, get whatever you got going. Get comfortable. Get your Bible out. Spend some time. Do, what you, do the things that you, that you have to do in order to, to make yourself to where you can actually embrace that presence, to where you can be comfortable in God's presence, to where you can do what he's asked you to do. We can go a little further, though. That legalism, no movies, right? No lipstick. Hmm. No secular music. No dancing. Right? Legalistic, right? Those are all things you're all shaking your head. Uh, I want to do all those things. <laughs> Why do Baptists hate premarital sex? Because it leads to dancing. You know, you know, <laughs> you know, you know. You got the Methodists on the other side that you know dancing. That's all right. Let's play some truth or dare. Woo let's do this. They, they just don't care. Make out sessions in the back of the van. You know, you can see both sides. You have that grace side. You have that truth side. You have you, you, the, the thing is that we're we're at the stage of rebellion. We know what's right. We just don't care. We know which direction we're supposed to go. We know what we're supposed to do. We just don't care. It's like a two-year-old. <sighs> Tiny, crazy little child. Right? <laughs> if you have a two-year-old, you know what I'm talking about. Tiny, crazy little child. No teeth. Holes in clothes. Running around. Ah, give me! do whatever they want. It's kind of like a rebellion. You tell them no, and they go, huh, whatever. <laughs> Don't touch that. They do it anyway. Don't touch the stove. They're like, they'll just let it burn. You know, <laughs> that's going to hurt. You know, and that's where we've got, they just go, they know not to do it. They just still do it. They just, you know, and see, here's the thing, you know, I've had a two-year-old in my own time, just straight lie to me. In fact, I, you know, almost, I almost had the same thing last night. Cause I, you know, I kind of, I can, you, you, when you see your child, you know, they're walking around and they keep grabbing their crotch. They don't do it like how guys do it. I got to adjust myself and do whatever. They're doing it cause they have to use the restroom. And that's why they're doing it. And so I asked him last night, we're wandering through six flags. I go, you going to use the restroom? Nope. <laughs> I go, you sure? 
And we get over there, and I said, dude, why don't we just go in there and use the restroom? And I, he couldn't get his pants off fast enough, right? He was, oh, God, I gotta go, you know? And it's, you know. But there's been other times when he was small, you know, or even when Haley, or actually all three of them did it to me. You know, we'll use Aubrey for an example, because she's not around and doesn't have to face this. So I remember when Aubrey was small, that I would look at her and I go, do you have to use the bathroom? And she'd look me straight in the eye and just start going poop. <laughs> just look at me right in the eye and go, no. <laughs> She'd be like, be like, you sure? <laughs> certainly looks like you have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and it, it, it was, you know, and see, that's the thing. <laughs> She is going to see this. Now all of you are going to share it to her. You should hear what your dad said. You know, but see, that's the, it's the quickest way. It, this is the quickest way to raise teenagers that are rebellious is to have a teenager full of rules without a relationship. To have that relationship, to not have, you just go, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. They will rebel. Don't do this, and you will turn them away so fast. Now, grace without truth leads to do whatever and believe whatever. That's where, you know, where we get to. It's kind of like they've issued us a license to do whatever you want. Here you go. You know, and, and, and see, the thing is, is that it's kind of like uh, anybody in here have a 16-year-old that just got their driver's license and they're like, <laughs> they think that that's... They, they, they literally, at 16 years old, they think that they just turned into a full-fledged adult and they can do whatever they want. I got my driver's license. I can take your car and go anytime I want. You did hear your, the first part of that, right? Your car. You know, and see, that's the thing, is that they, that's what they believe. They believe that they had this license to do whatever. Well, that's what happens when we live in this, and we have this relationship, or we have this, this belief that it's just grace without truth, that it's just, it's just this license to do whatever you want. God understands. That's what, it's, this is the line that we use. God understands. It's, it's your life, and no one can tell you how to live your life. Right? I believe in Jesus and I just do whatever I want. Whatever. I don't care. I believe. And I don't think that's how it's supposed to work. You know, you do these little snippets to make you feel good. You go out and you do these different things. But it's just not enough to make us different. See, people point at us and they go, there's something different about them. Those are the Christians. See, the thing is, is and I love that line that Rick Warren uses. Rick Warren uses, is there enough evidence to convict you of being a follower of Christ? Is there enough evidence to convict you of being a follower of Christ? Or do you just look like everybody else? See, the thing is, the Bible tells us the road is, is broad that leads to hell. And the road, and, and, and really the trail or the, the path that leads to heaven is a narrow road with a narrow gate. And so when you start looking at our lives if it doesn't look different to where we're on that different road that's narrow and, and it's hard. And our life looks like everybody else's life. Well, which road do you think you're on? You know, and I use this story and you're probably tired of it. And I'm glad I played a video a couple weeks ago about, you know, sometimes, Pastor, don't you have a new story? No, I don't have a new one. Here's the story. Is that if you've ever driven down Highway 24 and you've gone through the Caldecott Tunnel... Right before, come on, babe, don't ruin it for me. <laughs> come on, I, I was on a roll. But you ever driven down this road, and if you come from this direction, if you come on this side, and you get to right before the, you get right before the exit, and all of a sudden you get off, or right before the tunnels, there's an exit called Old Tunnel Road. I know, she already told you that. It just took, see, it took the whole joy and, and blew up the, the sail, out of, the wind out of the sail, everything. It's like, whoo. <laughs> crash me in a blaze of my glory and everything anyway so you get off of that and you, when you get off of that road on that exit you look around and you go there's no way that this gets me to the other side there's no way but there is and you start getting on and you start taking the turns and you get through it and i will tell you is that going that way and I, and first off I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna give you a, a before you just decide to decide to go take this old tunnel road Make sure you're in a smaller car. 
and, and, and make sure that you have a little bit of time because it's not, it's not a shortcut. It's the long way. But when you go this direction and you get off and you get up into the hills, you realize that you see some of the best views of the Bay Area. You see the beauty that God has created in our area that we miss so often because we just blow through the tunnels. We just go and, and see you guys, we get so, we've gotten so to the point of driving so fast through tunnels. Anybody ever as a, when you're driving along, you, you use the little thing where, all right, we're going into the tunnel, hold your breath. <laughs> and the person who's driving puts the, puts the accelerator down a little further. It gets you through a little faster. That's the way we've gotten our lives. We just, we're starting to hold our breath and just blow through everything. Instead of really taking the time and slowing down and seeing the beauty and seeing what's out there. And I'll tell you is that it, 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 you have to do it at least once. It's beautiful. And it's just, you know, and I mean, granted, you get to go see some really nice houses up there too. But we have to get to this point where it looks different. That's the road. We, you know, when, you get, when people ask you, why are you going that way? Because I, be, I, I need to do something different. It needs to be part. I need to go experience the beauty and see what God really has created for me. For me to be able to enjoy and see. And we've just lost that. And we've missed a lot of it. <sighs> you know, and, and, and I put in here, anybody in here go and get the flu shot? Anybody ever do that? And so when you get the flu shot, they give you just enough of the flu for you to not experience the full flu. See, for us, we're living our lives. We come to church and we get just enough church for us to really... To, to say we're a Christian, but really not experience what God has given to us and said, here, this is what you're supposed to be doing. This is what you're supposed to have. This is what God really wants for you. It, it, it becomes very, very simplistic, and our relationship is not, is not in-depth, and it's very surface level. A lot of times we get to this point, and we believe whatever. As long as you're happy, that's all that matters. Oh, as long as you're sincere doesn't matter what you believe. As long as I don't hurt anyone, it doesn't matter what I do. These are all lines that people have been told and they're just fallacies. They're, they're, they're lies. You know, grace and truth. And the thing is, when you read this and you read in John, grace is listed before the truth. You know, when you look at this, and I can't prove... But I can tell you is that I think it's because we're supposed to lead with grace. I think we're supposed to bring grace first, but also still supposed to have truth. You know, church should be a safe, piece, a safe place for people to belong before they can actually believe sometimes. People walk in here all the time, and they don't know Christ. But they have to feel safe when they walk in the door, and they have to feel like they can belong here that way. You know, and, and see, it has to be... You know, it, it, and the, the, it has to also be a safe place to belong before they can behave. You know, they got to be able to, people have to feel safe in God's comfort and in God's care before they start behaving those rules. And so if we go off and we just go and we're all judgmental, oh, why are you wearing those clothes when you walk in the door and why are you doing this? Then we basically shut them out and, sh and shut them down before they've actually even walked in the door. Our message can't be change your behavior and then you can be one of us. That's what the, the message can't be that. The message can't be, you have to change what you're doing before you can be a Christian. That's just not how it goes. Our message is, come follow Jesus, and he will help make you change. And he'll help you make those changes, and he will lead you to the full life he wants you to have. So that, that's the thing, is that, you know, when he comes and he meets Matthew, right? And he comes up to him and he doesn't go, hey, Matthew, as he's standing on the side of the boat, you know, off the, off the shore, and he looks at him and he goes, I'd really love for you to follow me, but before you do that, I need you to be perfect. I mean, I'll teach you how to be a, a fisher of men, but I, I need you to be perfect before then. He didn't say that to him, right? He tells him, he says, cast away those nets and let's go. You know, and here's the thing is that they had this, 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 this at this point, they, literally, he had just walked up. He walked out of nowhere. You know, it's like he just, he just shows up and he goes, hey, could you imagine this? Can you imagine this guy walking up out of nowhere? Just shows up at your job site. <laughs> he just walks up and goes, hey, hey, Mike. Hmm. 
I think you're cool. Put down that pen and follow me. <laughs> and you just go, all right, let's do this. I mean, there's no other, there's no convincing. There's no nothing else, right? There's not like, hey, here's the benefits. Here's the money that's involved. Here's what we're going to be doing. There's nothing. We're going to make you fishers of men. Just come on. And you'd be like, what? There wasn't, that, that line is not in the Bible. It's not, there's no what? You know, <laughs> what are you asking me to do? They just said, okay. They didn't even say, hey, can we talk it over with our dad who's out there fishing in the water right now? No. They, they literally just go, oh, well, we were looking for an excuse to get out of here. And they followed. And, they, and, and see, the thing is, is that not only did they follow, they followed and they, and, 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 and they became disciples. They gave everything. We're not even halfway in the game as them. We don't give anything sometimes. We're like... Sunday morning, man, God gave me that to sleep in. <laughs> I know. You know, and, and, I don't, see, come follow Jesus and he'll lead you to the life that's full and abundant. That's what we have to get to. This post-Christian generation is skeptical about the truth. You know, if you claim to know the truth, you're, ar you're arrogant and dangerous. You know, I'll tell you that. And this post-Christian generation isn't searching for, so for, for certainty. They're searching for honesty. You know, they're not just searching for the certainty. They're looking for honest. And they, they want this, they, they'd like to see our hearts really honest. And we haven't gotten it right. I hear people, I go, I don't like Christians. And what they really don't like is they don't like religious. They don't like that, the, the religion. And I understand it. Half of them drive me crazy too. You know, they just do. You know, and if you've been hurt by somebody in church, I'm not surprised. Christians hurt other Christians. They tear one another down. It's because it's truth without grace. You know, there's a great book, Why We Eat Our Own. It's the first thing that we do. Somebody commits sin, instead of helping them and guiding them and giving them grace... You tear them apart, you kick them out of a small group, kick them down the street, you're fired, whatever. We, we don't give them that grace. Truth isn't restrictive, repressive, or oppressive. Truth is freeing, liberating, and life-giving. You know, what are we doing? Are we, are we telling people the truth? Or are we destroying it? Are we, are we, or are we repressing people and tearing them down? You know, when you look at this, when Jesus comes in, all right, let's, let me even go further back than this. Let's go back to the beginning of the, in the garden. God literally tells Adam and Eve, eat of any tree. Eat of any tree except for one. And it wasn't to kill their fun. It was to give them life. It wasn't to be like, oh, we're, you know, we're party poopers. No, 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 don't eat of that one. No, it was to give them life. Joy, happiness. Truth isn't just rules and morals. Truth is a person sometimes. It's just not who, and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and it sets you free, right? You start looking at this, and you start seeing it. You start seeing what's going on. So often have we missed it. Now, grace without truth, too long have churches been boring and outdated, you know, and that's just what's going on sometimes. So let's make it relevant and cool. That's grace without truth. We have to make it relevant. We have to make it cool. People aren't searching for a church that's cool. They're searching for a savior that's real. That's what they're searching for. Who is Jesus? The word that became flesh, full of grace and truth. Are we full of grace and truth? He confronted hypocrisy. He comforted sinners with truth and grace. Hmm. The Pharisees <laughs> calls them vipers and snakes. You know, you start thinking about it. The immoral woman of grace, the living water, you will never thirst again. In the church, he confronted them. He comes in, he goes, You've turned my father's house into a place of business. He turns over tables. 
you know, anger. But he confronts him in truth. With grace, though, he turns around and he invites the tax collector, the criminal, to help change the world. You know, with truth, he calls out and he, and, and, and he, and he, and he talks and he, and he goes, your hypocrisy, you hypocrites. And he calls them out. And he hated pretenses. But with grace, he loves the outcasts, he touches the lepers, and he befriends the prostitutes. This is what he does. Does it sound like somebody who's looking for somebody who's perfect? Does it sound like somebody who looks like, oh, we got to judge people before he ever interacts with them? No, the only, the only people he was upset with or judged is that he took them and the ones that thought they knew everything already. And the ones that continued to to try and lead everybody to try and be perfect. And he knew that he needed to be the one that made that. See, Jesus was a line crosser. He stepped over and he did things a little differently. Every time religion drew a line, Jesus crossed it. Every time. And see, the reason why is because because people are on the other side of that line. They would draw a line and go, hey, wait a minute, there's people over there. I've got to go get them. They'd draw another one. Wait a minute, there's still people over there. We've got to get those people. And that's what he would do. People that have been hurt by the church. Uh, see, the problem is, before I get into that, before, the problem is we are drawing lines to keep people out of church. That's what we've done. We've drawn lines that keep people out of church. And that's not what Jesus did. Jesus crossed those lines. He did whatever it was taken, whatever was necessary to get people to have a relationship with him. That's what he did. And we're drawing the lines going, nope, that's not okay. Nope, that's not okay. He didn't care. People that have been hurt by the church. I've had people come and do repairs on my house. I stopped going to church. You know, I have a friend. They were attending a church. Did some work for the church. And... Uh, Church ended up owing them over $100,000. So he did a lot of work. Church didn't pay him. And so he stopped going to church because of what a singular church did. He was hurt. And so we talked, and I called him up, and I go, hey, I need some work done. And he called me, and he's all, for the church or for you? <laughs> I go, for me. And he goes, yeah, I don't do church work anymore. So, you know, instead of... He, he, he got to that point, and it was just conversation and sitting down and talking with him and just spending some time with him. He's back in church. I mean, he still owed money, but he's back in church, and he's doing what God has asked him to do. He's not at our church, but he's back in church. It's about, it's about helping. It's about the relationships, and sometimes we have to do something. Ah. I think now he's serving on the worship team again. Guys, you can take somebody who's gone and angry and gone, I need, to, I need to walk away, and you can help them restore and get back in and, and being able to, to do what God's calling them to do. Grace and truth. Uh, what we need to start doing is rejecting that watered-down, distorted view of Christianity. That's what we have to really start getting to. We have to reject that. And we have to see who Jesus, we have to see Jesus for who he really is. And I think that when you see that, I think you may really want to follow him. See, and that's the thing, is that when they walk up, and he walks up to the side, and he goes, hey, follow me. I, they could really see who he was. That's the reason why the questions didn't come up. You know, you ever, you ever see sometimes, you, I hear women say it to each other all the time, there's a glow about you. You know, and you get the line after that, you must be pregnant, you know, but... <laughs> There's a certain glow about you. No, I think that Jesus had that certain, you know, people saw him, they're like, <laughs> you're the man, I'm following, I'm going, let's do this. You have a glow about you. And he wasn't carrying a child, you know. <laughs> you know and see, that's the thing is that people saw it and they go, I, I want to follow him. And I think that when you truly get to see who he really is, you want to follow him. It's all this distorted view that we put in by denominations and all these other things that we get this, this that we, you know, we start seeing things through lenses that were never really intended to be put there. 
you know, we, we have to get to this point where we reject that and we get rid of this watered-down version of Christianity. So look at my notes. I said, there's this grace and there's scandalous, undeserved, irrational, lavish grace from Jesus. From Jesus. That's what it is. It's just lavish. And then there's the truth. And it's living but this uncompromised truth of Jesus, not to condemn, but to set free. You know, when you start seeing this, now how does this all wrap back up into this nation? This one nation under God. What's the truth? And what's the grace? And what are we supposed to be doing? And what direction are we supposed to be going? And if you look at our country right now, it's so divided. It's so liberal, so conservative. You have people, I literally heard the, the statement, I can't believe you voted for him with two friends. I, I, they, they, I couldn't believe it. And instead of going, I voted, well, God asked me, or, you know, and, and you have to have this time and start realizing is that we are going to have different opinions. See, the thing is, is that He's only going to need this country at this point for four years, and maybe not even that long, but in four years. The reality is, is that Jesus has been leading our country for 250 years. We just have to let him be back in control. We have to realize that when he was born 2,000 years ago, that he was the king of kings. And he was the one that was sent to set us free. And it wasn't these people that, were, that are in office now, that they're, they're not in control. You know, they happen to be in control for a time. They happen to be in charge for a period. It's our responsibility to be that light in the darkness. It's our responsibility that when, when everything else goes dark and everybody does those and everybody gets negative, it's our, it's our responsibility to be the positive and to be that light that people are drawn to, that beacon that people see, and they go, I need to go to that. They're, they're staggering, and they're, they're growing through the room, and the piles of laundry, or whatever it is, it's getting to that light. It's getting in the direction and getting closer to God. And the only way that they're going to do that is if we have this uncompromised view and this uncompromised message of Jesus. That's the only way it's going to happen. We have to stop with all these other things and all these things that separate us, and, oh, we're a church for this, and we're a church for that. We're a church that helps make disciples. That's what we are. We take people that are far from God and we bring them close. That's all we're here for. Wherever they're at, whatever they've done, wherever they're at in life, wherever they, you guys, we have children's church for a reason, right? Anybody in here believe your children are perfect? Doesn't mean we stop doing church for them, right? That's how we've gotten with people, though. We've gotten to this point where we go, we have to stop doing church for them. We have to stop trying to reach them. They're already too far lost. Is that how we believe with our children? Is that how we believe? Even if you have a child that's in their 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s or whatever, do you give up on them? No. So why are we doing that now? Why are we doing that with this community? Why are we doing this with those people that are on the left or those people on the right or whatever they're at? We are one nation that believe in one God that want to pursue him wholeheartedly and help make disciples. That's what we are. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for, for just calling us in grace and truth and calling us for this message to love and to reach everyone and to make disciples and it doesn't matter if you're on the left or the right or conservative or liberal or you know they live in a blue state or a red state it, you don't care you just love them you want us to love them you want us to help them grow and you want us to help them build a relationship with them and if you, with you and if you you want them to change then you'll make those changes that you'll help them grow that you'll turn them and mold them into the disciple that you've asked them to be. Father, it's our job to just help introduce the relationship and help build and help them grow and help them have the tools necessary to come to know you. So Father, we ask for strength 
to be able to do that, to pursue you, to help people pursue you, to help guide our neighbors towards you, to help guide our, the, the ones that we are angry with and the ones that we love and, and our children and, and our children's friends, even the ones that we go, I don't really want you hanging out with him, but to guide them into love with you, into a relationship with you. Father, we ask for strength to be able to persevere when we know, we know that it's going to be hard. We know that the, the road is narrow and the gate is narrow that leads to you. And so we know that the road, that traveling there, we're going to need your strength and we're going to need you with us. And that we can do all things with you. So we need that strength. We need the wisdom that you say that if you ask for, that if we ask for, you'll pour out abundantly. We ask for that wisdom, that discernment to help know which way we're supposed to go and which direction we're supposed to go. And how do we, how do we reach this community? And how do we love this community? And how do we, how do we have your eyes and your heart for this community? Father, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. And we're excited for we're excited for what you're going to do this month and what you're going to do through the edge and what you're going to do Christmas and the, the families that are going to come to know you this year. We, we're excited and, we, and we're amazed and we, we're in awe of the work that you're doing. Father, thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.